Well, greetings, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to join join us here today. I'll give you a little bit of background about me for those of you who don't know. Uh, my name is Mark Swanson. I'm a former CTO of a large software company. A few years back, uh, I left corporate America to start a small company to develop mobile software applications. So by day, I write Swift code for the Apple platforms, primarily Mac, Mac and iOS. And on uh, nights and on weekends, I like to tinker with pretty much anything. I've got a wood shop, industrial metal CNC. I like to design in 3D. I weld and I like to design and build electronics. I especially like microcontroller projects because I get to meld my, my love of electronics with my passion for coding. So today's talk will be roughly 10 to 15 minutes uh, on something called the Embedded Domain Specific Language or EDSL, followed by some demos and then we could do some Q&A with the balance of our time. So as a disclaimer, what we'll be discussing is still wet paint, so things will change. The goal today is really to introduce you to the project and start the process of gathering feedback um, to help inform development. Over the years, um, I've had a love-hate relationship with Arduino. Um, I love the low cost and the capabilities of the Arduino hardware. Boards are readily available and you can buy many different shields and add-ons. It's really a great ecosystem. And lastly, and this might sound a little strange, but I like that there's no operating system. When coding a microcontroller, you're in total control. I, I write a lot of iOS code, and if iOS is a, a jetliner, then my code is just a passenger and coach. It's really just along for the ride. And for most of the projects I do, an OS is overkill. And if I do need one, then there's plenty of options available. So starting out, what I was not so fond of was the Arduino IDE and having to write code in C or C++. And over the years, I'm sure I've written over a million lines of C and C++ code. And I've just, I've been there, done that, don't care to do it anymore. Uh, thanks to Swift for Arduino, uh, with its much improved IDE and the support for the Swift language, my two greatest sources of pain were alleviated. Now the Arduino libraries are a collection of some good and some not so good code. Uh, there's some great ones available when you wanna add support for Bluetooth uh, or stepper motor shield. And there are some not so great ones where I've spent a lot of time chasing down pin or timer conflicts or dealing with hard-coded constants that work fine for the library author, but not for me. The biggest issue is that the libraries come from so many different sources and they have significant gaps and overlaps. They're not compositional, so I can't use a small piece for this and then later go add another small piece for that. And every project I usually end up writing a lot of code to address basic needs that have been solved a long time ago. And I'd much rather spend my time on the business logic of my projects. And sometimes I find myself exhausting the 32K program space, and it'd be nice to squeeze things down as much as possible to extend what can be done on the platform. Uh, it's not obvious what the Swift compiler is doing to turn the Swift into machine code. And through a lot of experimentation and a lot of conversations with Carl, the Swift for Arduino inventor, I've discovered that small changes to the Swift code can have significant impact on the program size. In a massively constrained system like Arduino, this matters. The Arduino wiring API that we use today was designed uh, for C and C++. I think it's great and it's made microcontroller programming accessible to millions, but it's not modern and it doesn't take advantage of the things Swift offers. Now, I believe the, we can improve on these last three areas so my talk today will be about ways to do just that. So this is an illustration of uh, how we program an Arduino today using Swift for Arduino. Uh, we'll call this classic. At the bottom is our Arduino hardware, and on top of that sits the Swift for Arduino AVR library, which provides standard uh, Swift standard library, wiring, and some custom APIs. We can also mix in other Arduino C and C++ libraries to provide access to additional features and hardware. And then at the very top, of course, sits the programs the users write. While this all works well, it does force us to use legacy APIs and limits our ability to adopt Swift style. It also limits our ability to move user programs to other platforms. In addition, to work with multiple peripherals simultaneously, user programs can quickly become complex unresponsive and buggy. And I'll be illustrating that in a few minutes. So let's look at an alternative approach. Again, at the bottom of this illustration is our hardware. But in addition to Arduino, we'd like to target multiple MCUs from a variety of processor families. 
and sitting on top of the hardware is a very thin and lightweight hardware abstraction layer that provides the higher level layers a consistent platform neutral API. And this layer is optimized for each platform to be extremely fast with a tiny footprint. This allows the user programs access to many hardware platform, um, many different hardware platforms with a consistent API, but HAL only provides basic low level access to the microcontroller ports and peripherals. It removes some of the overhead of wiring and is proving to reduce program size and at the same time offer better performance. And it's great for bit twiddling and fine grain control, but it's low level API can be somewhat cryptic and it doesn't address what most users program needs, which are modern, easy to use API for everyday tasks. So uh, that's the job that we're gonna hire EDSL to do. So the embedded domain specific language is an entirely new API for MCU programming that sits atop HAL. It's written entirely in Swift and with it user programs are easy to create and maintain at the same time powerful and very, very readable. It provides a set of highly tuned components to perform common tasks and to control peripherals. And as this illustration here shows, <clears throat> you, you can uh, use EDSL, you can use HAL, or you can use both. So EDSL is a declarative style of programming that is great match for MCU programming where everything is ha happening at once. Declarative programming aims to express business logic without describing explicit program flow. The focus is on the what instead of the how. For example, in a declarative style, we would say, when a button is pressed, slowly fade an LED on, rather than set up one pins mode to input, then set up another pins mode to output, create a loop, read the button input value, and if it's high, slowly increase the LED's digital PWM value over time. Now this how or the recipe still does exist, of course, but it's behind the scenes and left up to the EDSL implementation. In trivial examples, the real power may not be immediately obvious, but consider a user program to simultaneously fade four LEDs on and off, each with a different maximum brightness and each with a different on time and a different off time. Or consider blinking an LED that is fading on and off while reading a sensor and debouncing a switch all at the same time. Traditionally, either of these examples would result in a rather large and complex user program. With EDSL, they're trivial, quite small, and we'll see that in a few minutes here. So here's a quick recap. EDSL is modern, it's swift, it's declarative, it's simple. It's portable, allows us to take our user programs from platform to platform with little or no modification. It's very powerful, gives us a rich set of components to work with common MCU-based tasks and peripherals, and it's event-driven. Uh, Delay-driven programs tend to quickly become unresponsive and are very limiting. As a matter of fact, there is no delay function in the EDSL. So let's take a look at some code here. Here we can see the classic uh, Blink program. <clears throat> I'm sure you've all seen this before. And here's the equivalent EDSL Blink program. Now they're very similar, but one big difference is the lack of the two delay calls. The classic Blink could be written delay-free, uh, but the approach that I'm showing here is the most common. So let's make this just a little bit more complex by introducing a second LED that is blinking twice as fast. So the code changes from the previous example are highlighted. Here we can see the classic program got much larger. I had to shrink the font just to fit it on the slide. Now notice the delays are gone, which is a good thing, but it required a completely new approach and the complexity took a big jump just to add a second blinking LED. Now look at the EDSL version. Again, the code changes from the previous example are highlighted. Not only is this much shorter, it's much easier to read and to understand. Adding the second LED simply required copying and pasting the code that declares the first LED and change its pin and blink times, and then add that new component to the board update loop. Now just for fun, let's say we don't like the harsh blinking and we wanna soften up the transitions by smoothly fading on and smoothly fading off. Think about the approach you'd take. Two blinking LEDs, each with a different on time, different off time, fading on, on and off as they transition. Has anybody tried this? From a high level, you can imagine someone saying, that should be pretty easy. 
for classic, it would be a lot more code. And it wouldn't be readable here if I shrunk the font enough to make it all fit. You'd probably have to write a couple of functions to reduce boilerplate code, maybe even a data structure to represent the LED on, off at fade times, and then maybe an array to hold a data structure for each LED. Regardless, it would be another big increase in complexity just to add fading. And I'll leave that coding exercise to you as homework. Now on the EDSL side, we simply add one line of code for each LED. That's it. No complex ramping of two different PWMs over time. And most importantly, we didn't increase the complexity or sacrifice readability. And we did not have to make any structural code changes from the previous example. We just have to add two simple lines of code that declare what we want. Now, I chose to give you a taste of classic versus EDSL using LEDs because LEDs are simple and they're easy to understand devices. But you can see that even programming simple devices in classic can quickly become difficult to program in meaningful ways. And most programs do a lot more than simply flash LEDs. So if you're wondering what EDS, uh, EDSL will provide, uh, here's the, the wish list. As you can see, uh, some of the components are quite basic and some are more complex. But for me, they represent a fairly large percentage of the things that I, that I use with my Arduino projects. Um, how many components will be made available and when? It's a discussion for another day, but I did wanna go beyond just a thought experiment and develop a proof of concept to see if the goals I was after could be achieved. So I'll give you a little bit of background on my work so far. As I started, I wanted to assure the cross-platform nature. It's very important to me. So I decided to develop uh, EDSL in Xcode for iOS. No Swift for Arduino, no Arduino hardware. Now, as you may have already guessed, there is no Arduino simulator for iOS. So I had to build one. Now, admittedly, it's crude and it's not pretty, but it is functional. It allowed me to develop EDSL on a non-Arduino platform. Interesting sidebar, like me, anyone who develops for iOS has probably used the iOS simulator that's part of Xcode. What's a bit odd is that when I work on EDSL, I'm running, I'm running it on an Arduino simulator that is running on an iPhone simulator that is running on my MacBook Pro. So after I got EDSL somewhat hammered into shape, I took a crack at getting it to run on the actual Arduino hardware. And I used the same Swift for Arduino and the same APIs that you all use today. It's proved to be pretty easy. Now, as I was doing this work, the HAL project, the hardware abstraction layer I showed in my slides earlier, it was starting to uh, get up and running. So I took a sidebar to see what it would take to get EDSL running on top of HAL. And I'm excited to say this was very easy and it was a big win. The big win was my programs were much smaller running the top HAL. So EDSL already has been running in three different environments. For the proof of concept, so far I've implemented all the components in the first column, and I'll be continuing to work on the remaining ones. All right, so uh, I think let's take a look at some of the EDSL in action. I'll leave a couple notes about the demo. What you're gonna see is EDSL running in today's shipping Swift for Arduino. As a result, in addition to the new EDSL API, we'll be compiling and including all of the wiring and all the Swift for Arduino APIs. So program sizes will be artificially bloated and not representative of what actual program sizes will be after we strip away wiring and the classic APIs. Um, HAL is a work in progress, but in early builds of EDSL against HAL, the program sizes ran about 4K smaller than what you'll see today. Now, as many of you know, Swift for Arduino does not support Swift classes. EDSL proves you can do a tremendous amount without them. It does use many of the modern Swift features like property wrappers, protocols, associated types, et cetera. The demos you're about to see are real. There's no smoke and mirrors. It's simply EDSL running on stock Swift for Arduino with stock Arduino hardware. And today I'll be using two different hardware setups to simplify the wiring. So I'm gonna um, switch over here to Swift for Arduino, and we'll take a look at some, some examples here. Now, there is another, uh, I don't know if you guys could see the other uh, window, but I'll be using this uh, board today. Uh, it's a standard Arduino Uno. Um, what I'll be plugging into it is a, a shield. This one is called the Danger Shield. 
Um, I use it because it has a, uh, a bunch of IO on it. It's pretty simple. It's got slide pots, uh, a couple of LEDs, some buttons. It's got a peripheral expander um, that is uh, attached to a seven segment display. That's one setup. The other one is uh, a, uh, another Arduino Uno clone. Uh, what's nice about this one is it has a bunch of uh, headers on it. You can see these white things here. Those are called Grove connectors and they basically allow you to plug a bunch of stuff in uh, without having to use breadboards. And that's really nice for the demo today. So that's just a little bit of the setup. So first let's take a, a look at the code from the slides. Um, not sure if we're, can you guys see both uh, my Swift for Arduino and the hardware setup? Yes, if I, not, can... I put them on both monitors. So... Okay, great. So here, uh, I'm gonna switch to the um, classic Blink program that we showed in our slides. And let me quickly plug this in. You have to bear with me here. I don't have a technical staff helping out, so it's just me. All right, and I'll tell you this uh, Chrome is going to be a problem. All right, let's just upload the standard uh, program here so you guys can see that. There you go. Hello world for Arduino, right? We all know and love that. So. Just quickly, we'll switch over to the equivalent in DSL. And um, just a quick walkthrough, um, the way DSL works is you declare a uh, variable containing your DSL component. In this case, we're gonna create an LED. Uh, it's attached to pin 13, we're gonna tell it to blink. And then any components you want actively running, you simply put inside of this board update loop and we're currently using our Arduino Uno, so that's what we're doing. That's the entire program. We'll upload that. I'm gonna get some of this Chrome out of the way here. So I can see what's happening. And there you go. There we have the uh, basically the same program running. Now, one note I'll I'll make here is that um, in the demo I was uh, setting blink times. If you're uh, really observant, you'll notice I didn't do that here. Um, EDSL has property defaults for just about everything. Uh, what that does is, um, in this case, the blink on and blink off times are uh, defaulting to 500 milliseconds. So in a lot of cases, you can declare a component without having to do any setup and you'll get the default behavior. Of course, if you don't want that, if you wanted longer delays, you simply uh, have to add one more line of code. So enough for blinking. Uh, we're gonna go to blink two here. And to do that, I'm gonna have to plug in my Danger shield, give me just a second here. I need two LEDs. And the code here is very similar. You know, we have an LED on one pin, an LED on another pin. We're gonna set up some blink times. You'll notice here that the first LED is gonna blink rather slowly, one second on, half second off. Another side note here is these um, parameters in EDSL are generally, um, hardware agnostic. So in this case, one means one second, uh, 0.5 means a half second. So we're getting rid of milliseconds and it's not uh, such a big deal here, but in some of these examples, you'll see why that's very important. Uh, the second LED will blink uh, twice as fast. So it'll blink at half second on, quarter second off. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, we, have, so we have fading going at the same time. And those are the periods for them. We simply did tell the LEDs to blink and that's it. That's the entire program. We will upload that. And the LEDs are over here on the side. I'll cover up one of them just to show you. There's the one that's blinking on and off. Um, at the fast rate and the one down the bottom is the blinking on the slower rate. So they're running independently and they're both fading very smoothly. And I know this is not too exciting for some, but if you've ever tried to do this, uh, code looks a little different than this. We'll 
switch uh, to next demo here because these aren't too terribly exciting. Um, we're going to blink now with a, a button. Uh, what this is going to illustrate is uh, the very similar to the last program. You know, we're setting up the LEDs, we're turning them on, we're setting blink times. But what I'm introducing here is two buttons. Um, and this is how you declare a button. You simply say button and what pin you want it on. And then the way the buttons, uh, the way we interact with buttons is uh, buttons will call uh, on value changed whenever their state changes. So in this case, button one state change, I'm going to look at the state, true or false, which means it's the button pressed or not. And if the button is pressed, I'm going to turn the LED off. And if the button is not pressed, I'm going to let it continue to blink. So all we're doing here effectively is adding uh, two buttons to disable the LEDs when the button is pressed. So let me run that real quick. Way too much Chrome on the screen here. And it's compiling. And the point here is to show that, you know, I'm not doing any uh, anything complex. So I just add them to the update loop. Uh, and, and these buttons actually that you're gonna see are also, um, they're debounced, uh, which means, you know, a lot of times these simple micro switches you see down at the bottom are very noisy when they're opening and closing and they can cause, they can actually cause a lot of false, you know, they can be on, tiling on and off very quickly. So built into EDSL is debouncing, which is another task that can kind of become um, time consuming to build. So I'm going to press and hold the button and you can see the top LED just goes off, comes back on when I release it. Same thing happens at the bottom. So this is just meant to show basically, you know, it's not really concurrent, but again, if you've ever tried to do that, it takes quite a bit of code, not much here. We'll keep moving on here. Um, this one is a, uh, Let's see, servo, now I'm gonna switch boards for this uh, because servos and other things take a little more IO. So just bear with me a second as I change boards. We'll bring in our board with the Grove connectors. And uh, what I've got going here uh, for this demo is um, I'm going to use an LED this button uh, here actually has an LED inside of it and a red LED. So in the code, we're gonna declare the red LED and we're gonna give it a very high rate of blink, uh, basically uh, 30 milliseconds. It's gonna flash very quickly. We're gonna declare a new component we haven't seen yet called servo. And I've got a servo plugged in here, a real simple hobby servo. And we're gonna use that button that I just mentioned. And here's it on value change. So when it's uh, uh, LED is, sorry, when it's value is low, we're gonna blink the LED and we're gonna set the servo value to zero. When it's not pressed, we're gonna turn the LED off and set the value to one. Now this is an illustration of what I was talking about earlier. Um, I set up the servo at the top. You'll see here min pulses and a max pulses. Every servo is slightly different. And what these do is control the timing of the pulses sent to the servo, which controls the angle. Um, but what I didn't do here is I didn't have to deal with a lot of different angles, a lot of different, a lot of math that you sometimes do. Uh, I just set the min and max pulse to get the, the, the amount of movement that I wanted. And it's a, I think it's about 180 degrees is what I got set up here. Uh, servos do vary. So then when I say, uh, set value to one, that says basically go to your clockwise direction to your limit and set value zero says go to your clockwise direction, sorry, anti-clockwise limit and 0.5 would be right in the middle. Uh, so it eliminates a lot of math of dealing with angles or trying to um, do conversions. Let me run this. And we should be using, let's see these two peripherals here. I'll try to get them in camera. Once the code compiles and runs. Again, button press, we're going to get an LED blink and uh, servo rotation. What's really nice about this, you can see the button is blinking quite rapidly. Uh, but I can also, in the middle of it, change direction and it just picks up where it left off. So it's highly responsive. Um, and most importantly, you look at my code, you'll see no delay loops, nothing overly complex. Um, I think most of you could read this code pretty easily. 
All right, so let's let's move on to something uh, one of my favorites, which are um, sometimes they're called NeoPixels or ILEDs is what we call them because there are many flavors. Uh, NeoPixels, kind of a brand name, as is Dot Star. Uh, they're basically LEDs that have a red, green, and a blue chip uh, inside of one package, and they have a small integrated circuit in them, so they can be individually addressed, um, and you could set uh, colors on them, and then once they're set, they kind of just drive themselves, which is really handy. So we call them ILEDs. So here's the program. Um, I have a, this is a small joystick. It's actually just two pots, one in X, one in Y axis. DSL provides a component called a potentiometer. And again, you declare one just like you do any other component, say what pin it's on. And the same thing, ILED is a component. And in this case, it's on pin seven. And then you give it a pixel count. This strip that I'm gonna be using today uh, has 10 because it um, fits well on the camera. I can tell you it's much more interesting to go beyond 10, um, but we'll just do that for today. And then I'm going to show you some of the functions that are available. ILED is a really rich library and provides a lot of functions that normally would take a lot. You'd have to write a lot of code. So the first thing we're going to look at is um, simply turning them all on. And hopefully I can, there we go, get to the button. Now I'll warn you that sometimes, and I'm going to have to angle these, these LEDs are so bright, they sometimes blow out the camera and it's hard to kind of see things but you'll get the general idea. And then hopefully you can just play on your own. There we go. Uh, and then what I've done, what I didn't tell you about is if you were looking at the code, you'd see that on the potentiometer's value change, take a look at this real quick. Um, I'm setting the LED brightness to the value. Now what's, this illustrates the power of the way DSL uses um, values, basically what I call unit values. They've got range from zero to one. So when the pot is, at its uh, minimum, it's zero. When it's at its maximum, it's one uh, float. Now that doesn't matter if it's an 8-bit ADC, ADC, a 10-bit A to D converter, 12-bit. Uh, every platform has different resolutions. The advantage of this is when you change platforms and you go from 10-bit, say, to 12-bit, you don't have to change your code. It just still returns one at its max value. What's also interesting is the LEDs uh, are 8-bit. Um, you can drive them 8 bits. So here I'm Inter interfacing a 10-bit ADD converter with an 8-bit peripheral. I didn't have to do anything just because maximum brightness is one, minimum brightness is zero. And I'll see if this shows up on the camera. I'm gonna actually try, there we go. I'm gonna dim and brighten the LEDs. Um, what's interesting about this to me is uh, the performance is quite good, very smooth. The ESL is pretty high performance. And I'll be doing a lot of benchmarking soon. As I said, this is really mostly just a proof of concept. Let me change real quick. You work with ILEDs. Um, there's some fun stuff if you want to do. This one's called Rainbow. It does kind of what you think. It's just simply going to um, display the LEDs. You have control of the color, obviously. Um, they're individually addressable. So um, this will take uh, hue from zero all the way around the color wheel. And so you basically get your Roy G. Biv. I may have to dim those down for you guys. And if you have more LEDs, um, you will see uh, finer uh, gradations. What this is gonna do is the first LED is gonna be at zero and the last LED is gonna be all the way around the color wheel. And if you have 100 LEDs, this is quite beautiful. And I've hooked it up to some very long strips uh, because it just mathematically calculates uh, every step in between. So the more LEDs you have, uh, the more different colors you see. So rainbow is a handy one if you wanna just get some pretty colors. Now rainbow effectively um, uses this next, next function, which is uh, give me a color gradient, but in this case, I'm allowed to uh, indicate what I want. Uh, the rainbow goes through the whole spectrum. This example here, I'm just gonna go from red to green. Um, you also notice I'm not specifying any hex values. I'm using uh, human readable constants like red and green. Uh, DSL provides uh, 12 color constants um, around the standard color wheel. There you can see you've just got a nice smooth gradation from red to green. Uh, those 12 color constants um, are available to you. Um, they're named like you kind of expect. Whoops, I'm sorry, I forgot to uncomment the line of code here. I'm gonna compile something that's not quite interesting. So uh, random colors are kind of fun. In this case, I've got random standard colors. What this will do, I've got the not interesting version here. Let me get 
that one turned down. There we go. So what this will do is simply for every LED you have in your uh, strip or loop or circle, um, it will randomly pick some colors for you out of the standard colors. Um, there is a way to get true random colors, you know, so any random color that's possible. Um, this happens to be uh, just controlling the palette. Um, and then one that I think is kind of interesting here, this is a brightness gradient. So these are all building blocks. The point is that um, the ILED component gives you these building blocks and you can mix and match them and do interesting things with them. Um, this is a brightness gradient. So what it's going to do is you can see it's declared as the color blue and I'm going from a very dim alpha uh, brightness of 0.4 to um, about 0.4. And I chose these low numbers, oh, excuse me just a second. I actually have to take off our brightness setting because that's overriding. It's changing the brightness. So, um, again, because these lights kind of blow out the camera, this may be a little hard to see, uh, but this allows you to get some nice special effects where you want to have smooth color gradations. I'm sorry, smooth brightness gradation. There we go. And maybe if I, that helps a little bit. All right, let me switch to, um, some animation. So the other thing that IDS, uh, ILAD provides is some, some simple animation. So this code here is quite simple. You can see it's a very short program. It's simply going to take, uh, declare an LED, set a brightness gradient like I just showed you, and then it's gonna perform uh, an animation. So you can simply call animate. There's various animations available. There's shifts, there's rotations, there's various things. We're gonna rotate and then you can specify in what direction. In this case, I've declared a frame time uh, so that I could control the speed of the animation. And in this case, I'm gonna be running at 20 frames per second. Let me get that going. Um, and again, you'll notice, you know, I'm using real values. Uh, I'm not using milliseconds or microseconds. I'm just using real world values, time intervals, as we like to call them. This is just about up, we'll see this. This might be a little better with a, some sunglasses on, there we go. So you can see the brightness gradient is animating. And obviously it's easy to control the speed. One line of code here defines the speed. Um, another interesting thing is I came from the iOS world. So there's a uh, concept there, animations can reverse. Um, so I brought that over. So I'm gonna use the same animation that you're seeing, uh, except this time I'm going to um, tell it to reverse. So as soon as the code uploads, see that run. There we go. So now you get this nice uh, continuously reversing animation. Again, quite simple code. I'll go to one more demo here. Let's go to, um, it's a very similar setup. ILED, an animation time, a color. Um, LED, these ILEDs are individually addressable. So in this case, um, I, can, I showed you earlier turning on all ILEDs. Here, we're just gonna turn on um, starting at index zero, four LEDs, and then starting at index five, four LEDs. So you can turn on less than all of them. You can control which ones that you want on and off. And let me get to the uh, build bar here. There we go. And then I follow it up with an animation. So at the bottom, you can see that we're going to um, rotate in the direction of right. And basically you get kind of that chasing LED effect. So the point of this demo here is to show you that by taking some of the primitive um, APIs combined with some of the animation APIs, you can get some pretty neat effects without having to write a lot of code. Now this is a kind of more of a, a technical demo. This is really just meant to illustrate to you. Um, I said there was no delay. You can see a delay in here. Um, this is not a EDSL delay. This is the AVR. As I said, I'm linking in all the code that you guys can use. So there is a delay in AVR. But what I wanted to do here was show you, uh, this, this is quite different. If you look at this code, you'll see that in the board loop, I'm saying our, uh, it's line 14, our RGB LED random standard colors. So basically, um, 
this is updating, and then I have a delay of a thousand, which is a second. You can see that every second it's changing the random colors. Um, now, I was curious, you know, how fast could we do this? So what I wanted to do here was show you if I take this out, this delay, and just tell the board update loop as fast as you possibly can, change the board, sorry, change the LED colors. And this is just something I thought of the other day to, to try out and kind of an interesting result. What ends up happening is that the uh, board update loop is running so quickly that effectively, you know, you don't see anything that's persistence of vision. Uh, so again, it's extremely high performance. Just a couple more guys and then we'll hit the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to switch gears here. So this, this was um, kind of an experiment. Um, this is as I mentioned, we started to work with how, and this is my sidebar. So this code looks quite different. This is how code. So this is not EDSL. So what you see here is we're not including AVR, we're including some different libraries. And we're um, going to basically access pins, uh, the slow level API, but it's quite different than um, pin mode, digital write and things you're familiar with. So it's, it's a much better way in my opinion more modern way, even though it's low level. So you can see we have board pin 13 mode output, fairly readable. And then in the loop, board 13 set high, wait one second, board 13 set low. So you can imagine what this is, right? This is a blink program. That's what a blink program would look like in HAL. And you're, you're, as I mentioned earlier, you're free to use HAL, you're free to use EDSL, whatever fits your needs. Uh, for the last demo here, I'm gonna switch hardware setups again quick. Um, I wanted to get a real, uh, DSL program running on HAL beyond just blinking. I'll bring back my danger shield. And uh, I just walk through the code quick. So um, again, this is running on HAL. And so this is kind of a melding of the two and it's a work in progress. We're gonna use two buttons on my danger shield. And we're gonna declare this um, component we haven't talked about yet called digital shift out. What this is, is basically it, it clocks data out a pin. So you define your pit clock pin, your data pin, your latch pin. Now on this danger shield, um, they've got uh, this, it's called a peripheral expander. I think it's a seven, four, five, nine, five. Basically you clock data to it and then it latches um, eight pins. So it's kind of like a use three pins to get eight device. And this danger shield, they've wired it up to a seven segment display, so it's kind of useful. Um, so this is how you declare a digital shifter. Pretty straightforward. Um, we're gonna keep a global variable, keep track of a digit. Um, and then this is a, a DSL command, a seven segment set numeral, we can set it to digit zero. And then a very simple uh, set of callbacks. When button one is pressed, we're gonna check and see, uh, when the button value changes, sorry, we're gonna check and see if it's pressed and if it is, and we're not, um, sitting at zero, then we're going to decrement the digit and display it. And very similarly on button two, if it's pressed, if we're uh, not sitting on nine, we're going to add one and display it. And that's it. It's quite simple. Again, this is a HAL program. Just wanted to show that running. So I'll compile and upload this. There we go. Um, so there we are. I, I wired up to these two buttons here. If I press this button on the right, we just count up and we count down. Very responsive. It never double jumps because of the button debouncing. Very smooth, very nice. Um, and this program, now I just compiled this out of the box. Uh, Carl did supply me with this magic way to not include wiring and AVR. So I'm going to go in and put this in. And what this is doing is basically stripping away um, the frameworks that we use every day. So all I'm left with now is how. What you'll notice is if you look over here on the, the right, uh, this program is about 8K. But now if I rebuild it with that uh, extra build argument, it will not link in AVR 
wiring and all that, you now see the program is much smaller. It's now about 4K um, and it's doing the exact same thing. Now, if you remember back to my uh, the beginning, um, we actually built standard blink and that's basically 4,500 bytes. So here, what you're seeing is uh, two buttons and a seven segment display and a bit of business logic all running in a program that's smaller than the off the shelf Blink program. All right, I'm gonna switch back here to, I have one last slide and then we'll open it up to Q and A. So there are no plans to remove the classic Swift for Arduino that we all use today. HAL and EDSL will be offered for those looking to adopt a modern declarative simplified set of APIs for programming Arduino and other platforms. You know, or uh, if you just want to go to another platform. Um, 